Everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Donald Cryer and I'm the chairman of the Yale Temple uh, History Society. And um, this is uh, uh, the Michaelmas term lecture, uh, which is part of a series where we're beginning to focus very specifically on aspects of the inn's history. And uh, I'll come to what we're looking at today in a moment. Um, the uh, numbers here are, are heartening. <laughs> And there are probably twice as many, if not more, listening online, which is the way that things are nowadays uh, and have been since, since COVID. But it does show uh, a strong general interest in the history of the inn, uh, and that is, uh, that's heartening. Uh, I hope you've all had an opportunity to see the uh, exhibition, which our archivist Celia has put together. Uh, if, if you haven't, uh, after this uh, uh, talk, if you go up the stairs outside, leaving any drink you have down here, um, uh, there is a, an interesting e exhibition of uh, some of the more uh, intriguing items from the Inns archives on the buildings of this period that we'll be, we'll be looking at. The uh, topic. For over 50 years, in the middle of the 19th century, two brothers, Robert, who became Sir Robert Smirk, and his brother Sidney, were successively the surveyors of the Inner Temple. And during that time, they stamped their mark on the inn in a way that uh, not many people, I think, realize. Uh, if one were to walk around the inn in 1870, one would have seen more Smirk than not. Uh, and uh, that was the case for the next 70 years until the disasters of the Second World War. Uh, we've got uh, this evening the, the great benefit uh, of having Dr. Jeffrey Tyre, uh, who's going to tell us about uh, the Smirks, their influence on the inn, uh, and uh, enlighten us in a way which I think most of us probably need, because quite frankly, uh, I don't think most people nowadays, outside uh, those with a particular interest uh, in the history of architecture, and particularly the history of 19th century architecture uh, in the United Kingdom, know much about them. The uh, great advantage of having Geoffrey this evening uh, is his uh, lifelong interest in architectural history. Uh, he was uh, uh, a history undergraduate at St. John's, uh, Oxford, and then uh, took a doctorate uh, at uh, London University. Uh, but since then, he's been the director of the Stamford University uh, undergraduate course at Oxford for over 30 years, uh, finishing not very long ago in that role. Uh, and he has taught constantly uh, on the history of architecture and town and urban planning, both in this country and in the United States. Uh, I would uh, not really have time, and I would succeed in, in boring you more than I normally can uh, if I were to read out the whole list of his publications and papers. Uh, but there's one that I can't ignore, uh, and that is this one, uh, because this is the Inner Temple Community of Communities, uh, for which um, we're, to some extent, uh, we're grateful to Claire Ryder, who's with us here this evening, for being the original editor. Uh, but uh, the whole section on the estate of the Inner Temple was actually written uh, by Dr. Tyre. Uh, and uh, that uh, is, uh, makes him uh, probably the, uh, the, the, the best man available uh, to give this talk uh, on the smirks this evening. The... Um, first part of it, I think, uh, according to our agreement on this, is, is actually going to kick off uh, with the, um, uh, the older brother, Robert Smirk, uh, and uh, then move on to his, uh, uh, his kid brother, who was some 17 years or so younger than him. There's a chronology uh, which uh, might, uh, might help you. It probably has any, some mistakes in it. Uh, if it has mistakes in it, they're mine and not Dr. Tyke's. <laughs> so, Geoffrey, uh, over, over to you. Thank you. 
<coughs> well, thank you very much for that introduction and also for asking me to come and give this talk. Um, I've been interested in the Inns of Court ever since I was a schoolboy, actually. Um, I went into academia rather than the law. I think those two subjects are actually fairly closely related. Um, I um, explored the city of London um, as, a, as a boy and walked around these courtyards without knowing anything very much about them um, and was very grateful to be asked to write um, a um, fairly detailed history of the history of the, bu uh, of the buildings here. Before I start, um, I'd like to um, thank Donald Cryon for asking me, the master Cryon, I should say, for asking me um, to give this talk. Um, I'd like to thank Celia Pilkington, who has been very helpful um, in giving me access um, to, the, to the inn's archives, and also um, to Claire Ryder, who first um, showed me what there is here um, some years ago, actually, um, when I wrote a chapter um, on the um, inn's buildings in the history of the, um, uh, of the inner temple, which came out 20 or so years ago. So here we have the two Smirk brothers. Um, on the left, um, we have Robert, um, and I'll tell you more about him later. And um, on the right, we have Sydney, and I couldn't resist mm. putting in Victor in between, um, just to remind you um, where we are. So whenever you're looking at a building, um, it's always worth asking what was there before. Um, and what, so if we ask what the inn was like before the Smirks became involved, um, we um, need to look at um, the ground plan, um, which is fairly fuzzy in the way that it's come up on the screen. But basically, um, the important thing to say is that it shows the um, the, the inn's buildings in 1820, brings out two or three things that are really important to know. One of them is that the river was originally much closer to the buildings um, than it is today. Um, second um, thing that is, um, uh, that, that, that is really important is that that changed um, with the building of the embankment um, in the second part of the 19th century, which enlarged the gardens. And I think the third thing to say um, is that the buildings, um, if you look at a plan, are a bit of a hodgepodge. Um, and that's because they grew up incrementally rather than being planned as a single entity. And from that, I think, comes a lot of their charm, but also a lot of the difficulty um, in really understanding them, and if you don't know the buildings very well. So essentially what we have is a closed courtyard um, with the church on one side, the temple church, which of course is shared between the two temples, um, and um, a courtyard in front of that, rather like an Oxford College quadrangle. Um, and I think that's what we see up at the top of the picture there. But what makes, I think, um, the inner temple very different from its neighbour, um, and indeed from um, the other inns, is the way that you have the also some long parallel buildings stretching down from the original core of the inn down to the river. And they give the place a lot of the very special character that it has today, um, with King's Bench Walk between the two wings and then um, another um, open space beyond going down to the garden. So let's start with Chapel Court. And I think the first thing we need to remember there um, is that um, the originally 
there were houses um, right next to the church. And in fact, um, one of the first jobs that Smirk had was actually to clear those houses. They wouldn't be allowed to do that now, by the way. Um, <laughs> we would um, treasure them for their history. But in those, day, pe those days, people had a different attitude to architecture. They were looking for something purer and more um, authentic in a way. Um, and so um, we have to tell, and we'll look at the, um, the, the history again, but you can see that those houses went right up against the south side of the church, um, which, as you all know, um, was shared um, and is shared between the, um, the, the, the Middle Temple and the Inner Temple. So to the left of that, of that um, left-hand image, you can see the so-called cloister, um, which was actually part of a building designed by none other than Sir Christopher Wren after the Great Fire, um, but of course was rebuilt after the war and the Blitz, which this inn in particular suffered so grievously from. And then on the right, just to make things more complicated for people um, who don't know um, these establishments, um, we have Lamb Building, which um, was in the courtyard in front of the church, and which you would assume would be um, part of the um, uh, of the um, inner um, of the inner temple, but of course um, it isn't. It's actually it belonged to um, the middle temple, um, and was actually um, cleared away um, much later. Um, so uh, now, uh, and you can see that in the in the bottom image. So here we have. Um, I want to start off really um, with the hall and its immediate surroundings. The upper picture, which was by, um, and I'm, I'm no less an art artist than Richard Wilson, one of the foremost. English landscape painters, um, shows the, um, the, the, the buildings after a big fire in 1737. Um, again, I hardly need to tell you that fire is the curse of especially legal buildings because they have so many papers in them. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they, uh, they, uh, a lot of um, these buildings suffered from fire. That one particularly badly um, in 1737. Um, and below that, we have the hall as seen from the garden. Um, so um, what, what we see there um, is, um, is a building on the left, um, which is Crown Office Row, which was built in the later 18th century named after the clerks of the crown in chancery, who were the keepers of the great seal, um, and then eventually got absorbed into the central government bureaucracy, after which those buildings became um, chambers. So um, the, uh, the, 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 you have that to the, to the left and the hall to the right. The hall um, was rebuilt and modernized on several occasions. If you look at those round arched windows, they are not the original windows of the hall. The hall um, was a medieval building, late medieval, um, but it was classicized later. Um, and you can just see, of course, the battlements of the temple church above that. So let's um, look at the in a little bit more detail. And those of you who are familiar with the hall today will not see very much similarity um, at all. Or indeed, those who were familiar um, with the hall before it got um, gutted by the Blitz in the Second World War wouldn't see very much similarity either. So on the top, um, we have 
the hall with its round arch classical windows, which must have um, been put in sometime in the early 18th century. And then below and right, pictures of the hall as it originally was. Um, and in fact, this is, you may, may be saying, when does Robert Smirk come into this? Well, the answer is that Smirk was first involved to, um, to uh, modernise the hall, to re it. Um, and that's because when we get into the first part of the 19th century, there's a renewed interest in Gothic architecture because it was historic. It reminded people of the past, also perhaps because um, the, uh, the, the, the members of the inn were very conscious of the history of the institution. Um, and they wanted to enhance that as a setting um, for the pictures, the panelling, and so on. And on the left, you, I rather like the bottom left image, which shows um, the members of the inn um, having their lunch or their dinner on either side, with a huge great iron stove in the middle to keep them warm, because originally they wouldn't have had something like that. They would have an open fire, and the smoke would have gone out, out through a louvre in the roof. This is just like Oxford and Cambridge halls, and the halls of the big country houses of the gentry and nobility. So there are a lot of links there. Then, as now, um, there were two big open courtyards stretching down to the river um, with paper buildings. Um, the building you see in the bottom um, uh, image between the two. And I would say that it's this um, layout which really stamps the character of um, the um, uh, of the inner temple and gives it its unique um, uh, identity. Notice, by the way, that the river is much closer um, to, um, to us, as it were, than it was after the embankment was built and planned in the 60s, finished um, in the 1870s. So that's what Robert Smirk would have found here when he first got involved um, as architect for the inn. So here is his first building, um, a library um, on the top with um, the Parliament chamber to the right. So who was this man? Who, Robert Smirk is not a household name. Anybody with even a, a vestige of interest um, in architecture will have heard of his um, contemporary John Nash. They were all even more likely nowadays to have heard of his other contemporary, um, Sir John Soane, whose house was, is just within walking distance of where we are today, and was fortunately um, preserved after he died because he left it to the nation. And we can enjoy that today. We have nothing like that with Smirk. He was born in 1780, second son of an artist who was also called Robert. Um, and he then went into the office of John Soane, um, who is slightly older than him, but fell out with him. And that's probably Soane was a very difficult man. Um, whereas Smirk, from everything, you try and build up a picture of what somebody was like. I, have, I get the sense that Smirk was efficient and amenable, um, which, uh, which um, certainly uh, Soane was not. Um, and so he, he, he had a couple of very important things happen to him. Um, he was, after he fell out with Soane, he went to the office of the main architect of the city, who was George Dance, and you can the younger George Dance, and you can see buildings by him in the city. Alas, not very many left, but there are some of them 
still there today. Um, he then went to the Royal Academy Schools, which was the only place where you could get an architectural education in the 18th century without um, becoming an article clerk to an architect. So he went there and then, very important for him, um, went abroad. Um, this is an age when people felt you could not be an architect unless you had been especially to Rome, but also ideally in the early 19th century to Greece as well. So Smirk went to Greece. He went to Sicily, where you have Greek temples which are as beautiful as those of Greece, um, though less well known. Um, and that gave him a first-hand knowledge of the architecture of classical antiquity. Then he got his big break in 1813 when he became one of the three attached architects, as they were called, to the Office of Works, which was the body responsible for building and maintaining government buildings. So in other words, it was a government department, um, and quite an important one. Um, and he, um, that, that, that gave him an income um, and in many ways a break, and he became um, well-known, and there was well-known enough to be appointed surveyor to the Inner Temple um, in 1819, probably through the influential connections he had made um, as <coughs> an attached architect, including the well-known connoisseur Sir George Beaumont, who was one of the real founders of the National Gallery collection. Um, Sir Thomas Lawrence, the most gifted portrait painter of the early 19th century, um, and um, Sir Robert Peel, no less, the politician and future prime minister. So you couldn't form an architectural practice without knowing people. You couldn't just suddenly say, I'm an architect um, and employ me. Um, so um, that, it, that, that led him on to some quite important co commissions. And here we have two of them. The first at the top is no longer there. Um, it's the uh, original Covent Garden Theatre. Um, and what a, it was burned down. Theatres were always burning down. Um, it was on the site of the present one. Um, and <coughs> the point about that I draw your attention to is, first of all, it's Grecian Doric portico. People felt the Greek Doric was the most essential part of classical architecture. Um, and if you put a Greek Doric portico on a building, that was really emphasizing um, its importance. Um, then at the bottom, his most well-known building, in which he employed the Ionic Order, another of the Greek orders, and that, of course, is the British Museum, which replaced the old Montague House, where the museum had been established in the middle of the 18th century. So these are really important um, commissions. You've got a fashionable theatre, at a time when theatre was really an important thing um, in London, and you had a major public building, um, which could hardly be ignored. He went on to design a number of other buildings. I'm not going to bore you with them in detail, but um, first was the General Post Office in St. Martin's the Grand in the city, um, demolished, um, the Custom House on the north bank of the Thames next to the tower. That's an interesting building. Um, and um, re uh, is ab about to be, well, has actually been um, restored to some extent. Um, King's College in the Strand um, is um, a smirk building. Um, the approaches to the new London Bridge, the north approach from what's now a big traffic intersection down to the bridge. He didn't design the bridge, but he designed the road from the city leading onto the bridge. 
and he also designed a number of churches. Those of you who know Marylebone might know um, the church of St. Mary Lindon Place, which has a very beautiful um, tower. Um, and um, he designed eight county halls um, at a time when county administration was becoming much more um, important. And he rebuilt or altered some 30 country houses. So this is a pretty substantial practice. Of course, he had clerks who worked for him, but he was the one who basically signed off and gave the buildings their character. Not all the buildings were classical. Um, he designed Lava Castle in Cumbria, which is now a ruin, um, which was Gothic. And he also designed Eastmer Castle in Herefordshire, which is not a ruin, um, and is an example of what you might call castellated Gothic. There, that is because the, the patrons wanted buildings to remind them of the Middle Ages, as was to be the case here at um, the Inner Temple, as we will see. So his success may have de derived from the fact that he was, in the words of a contemporary, good at, quote, pleasing men whom it is proverbially impossible to please. <laughs> now, far be it from me to say um, that includes members of the legal profession, um, and especially the benches of the inner temple. But um, the, it's true, um, from, if you look at the, um, the, the archives of the inn, that he was indeed an amenable architect. He didn't um, have rows with his patrons. He wasn't a prima donna um, like, um, uh, like Sir John Soane, who certainly was, um, or even more, um, Augustus Pugin, who was rather younger, who was very much a prima donna. Um, so Smirk is a different kind of architect, and I think you have to bear that in mind. He carried out a number of minor jobs in the 1820s. Um, he, he removed the shops in front of the church, as we've seen. He replaced part of Crown Office Row. He designed buildings in Hare Court. Um, he also extended the south side of King's Bench Walk, remodeled the Mitre Court buildings that we see on the side, looking south to the Thames. So there we are, looking at um, Smirk's very plain classical style, which he and the benches thought was appropriate for that kind of buildings. So that's the first Smirk. And here we have his largest building um, for the inn, I suppose, which is um, paper buildings um, built um, but um, actually the south end of it, at the right-hand side, um, was by his son later, and rather different in style, um, Neo-Jacobean, um, rather like um, Lincoln's Inn Hall, which was built in 1843-5. to five. And so you do see the beginning of a shift in style towards neo-medieval Gothic architecture. And you can see that here, um, if, if you, especially if you look at those buildings um, from the garden. Um, you can see the, um, the slightly, this is, it's not wholehearted Gothic, but it's Gothic detailing applied to um, buildings which have a basically um, classical character. And I'm sure the idea of that was to provide a backdrop to the view of the inn from the garden. People felt very often that, um, that, that, that medieval architecture complemented nature in a way that perhaps classical architecture didn't always. Um, <coughs> so he um, then in 1847, um, um, <coughs> decided 
is that her designs um, numbers four to five paper buildings um, and um, then went on um, in 1858 as we see here um, to design Dr. Johnson's building um, on uh, the, the, the site of an older building that um, Dr. Johnson had actually um, occupied. Um, but his main achievement as an architect, and the reason why I think he needs to be remembered today, um, is the building of the Round Reading Room at the British Museum. Um, and um, that, I, I think, is one of the great buildings of the, um, uh, of the period. And, of course, um, it's much easier to see this now if you don't have a reader's card. I've spent many hours in that building when I was um, doing my doctorate, um, and it's something that once seen, especially over a long period of time, implants itself in your consciousness. Um, um, and you can, that's what it looked like um, back in the 1920s. But his main contribution to the inn um, was the hall. Um, rebuilt um, in the late 1860s and much bigger than its predecessors. And um, there's a reason for that. This is a period when the inns of court were being revived, partly as a means of improving legal education, following a royal commission in the 1850s, partly because of a growing need for barristers' chambers um, to cope with the increase of in, in legal work, which was inevitably going on. And London was the largest, arguably the largest city in the world at the time. And um, there was a huge expansion of London, and with that, an expansion of legal work. So um, that's why the inn felt the need to rebuild its rather small hall. That picture at the top was taken when just before it was demolished. Um, I'm showing it to you just to give an idea of the difference in scale um, from the hall as built. Um, so stylistically, um, I think it's fair to call the hall an example of romantic medievalism. Um, and um, that took several forms. Um, the architecture um, is Tudor, or sometimes called perpendicular, Gothic in style, um, uh, with spiky pinnacles outside, um, and uh, as at um, the new Houses of Parliament, which you've got to remember um, were going up or being completed at the same time. They were built between about 1840 and 1860. Um, and it's also worth remembering, by the way, that just the other side of Fleet Street and Strand, you have the law courts, um, which you all know very well. Um, and um, that um, was another example of medieval architecture being applied to a modern purpose by one of the great Victorian architects, George Edmund Street, um, who um, designed lots of churches. And this was his final big commission. Um, and I, if you think of its site and its complexity, um, it's a thoroughly admirable building. So we go back to Smirk and the um, Inner Temple Hall. Um, you can see that this isn't one of the original drawings, which was on show upstairs, if you saw it. Um, and um, the building had a hammer beam roof, which, of course, is a very um, late medieval feature that you see um, in many places. Um, and um, perpendicular Gothic windows. And I don't know how clearly you can see this, but if you look at the far end of the hall, screen, um, there were four um, large figures by a sculptor called Henry Armstead, who was employed a lot um, in London um, uh, at this period, of Knights Templar and Hospitaller. So this is decoration, 
if he's celebrating the history um, of the building. It's a period where history um, helped determine the character um, of the architecture. So here um, we see the library um, as extended after um, uh, after the time of um, uh, sorry um, uh, after the time of Sydney Smirk, um, and you can see there um, the tower which was added to the um, Library and Parliament Chamber by another architect, um, and I'm just including this because it is part of the history of these buildings, called Arthur Cates, who was pupil of Sir James Pennethorne, um, a government architect who designed the public record office, as it then was, now part of King's College, on whom I wrote my doctoral thesis, <laughs> actually. Um, and um, so I had to bring him in somewhere. Um, and then um, on the right, um, another building um, by Cates. He's one of many little-known Victorian architects who did the ordinary jobs. And uh, I have to say that he had a bit of a, um, a, a chance to um, enjoy himself in that tower, which, alas, didn't survive the Second World War. And then, just to bring the picture up to the end of the 19th century, um, <coughs> the um, range of buildings um, in Hare Court alongside um, the lane there, which is by another very interesting architect, Thomas Graham Jackson, who is well known to any of you who are Oxford graduates um, as the person who designed the examination schools in Oxford, plus much else. It's very difficult. He was the, the book on him is very good, but it's built, written by a colleague of mine, and it's called Oxford Jackson. Um, but um, he, um, he designed that. And the interesting thing about that is it shows the shift in taste at the end of the 19th century, away from the sort of architecture that the Smurfs had practiced toward something, let's say, a little bit more gentle, um, with different with using brick, with red <coughs> brick in particular, um, and um, a lot of um, interesting details. So then came the Second World War, which was devastating um, for, for this particular, well, for the Inns of Court in general, but particular um, for the Inner Temple. The walls of Sydney Smirk's Hall survived the Blitz as we can see in both of these images. Although not much else did. Um, and if you look at the lower end, you can ju just see how much of the inn was gotten. And not just gutted, it was destroyed by direct hits. Um, uh, the question then arises, um, should the inn have rebuilt the um, <coughs> original, or the 19th century hall? Um, and that's um, a matter of opinion. Um, personally, I rather regret that the building has gone. I think it would have been a rather um, special, interesting um, building, which was saying something about the history of the inn. On the other hand, and you know, this is purely an outsider speaking, I can see the practical advantages of what has happened since as we see here, which, um, and most of you know these buildings extremely well, um, and it's interesting when you look at the, um, this, these buildings from the garden, how much of it is post-war. And I think the way that um, by two main architects who are worth mentioning, actually, because th this is a deeply unfashionable period of English architecture, period after the Second World War. First of them was Hubert Worthington, who did a lot of work in Oxford, 
I actually met my wife in a building designed by Hubert Worthington, which is the, um, which is the, the old history faculty library, uh, which some of you might know. Um, and um, the other one um, was um, Edward Moore, who designed the buildings to the left, who did a lot of work at um, my old college, St. John's. Um, and so, as so often, we'll have these links between the Inns of Court and the Oxbridge co Colleges. So, um, it's very much um, a case of Neo-Georgian trumping Neo-Gothic. Whether or not that was a good thing, I leave it to you to decide. But the story of these buildings is another story. Thank you. Jeffrey, we had um, the opportunity to speak uh, yesterday of, of some length and to me. I mean, it was an entirely fascinating experience. Uh, and um, the various topics were raised, which we weren't sure whether this afternoon you'd have time uh, to, to expand upon. Mm -hmm. um, can we just kick off a, a rather random one? Um, the, uh, the interior of the church, which <coughs> Um, I, I know you don't want to talk about a great deal, but it is, I think, quite important in terms of what um, you were telling me Sydney actually was doing in the 1840s. Well, I, I'm very happy to talk about the interior of the Temple Church. It's one of my favourite buildings, actually. Um, but um, the, the thing to remember there is that um, it's a, it was a, a victim to the change of taste from Gothic to classical architecture. Um, in the um, 17th and 18th centuries. The interior was changed a lot. Um, if you look at the rear doss in the temple church, that's part of the changes. It was designed by Wren, actually, the, the rear doss. Um, and um, when you went into that, you would see a Gothic building which had been classicized to some extent. What the Victorians want, wanted was to re-Gothicize it. This is one of the great buildings of, um, uh, 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 of early English Gothic. Um, and they wanted it to look like that. But you could say that um, they were not averse to gilding the lily. Um, and if you were to go into the building as it was in the 19th century before bombing, um, you would have been overwhelmed by the um, excess of painted decoration everywhere. Um, some people would admire it, some, I think, wouldn't. Uh, never having seen it and having known the Temple Church um, on and off for most of my life, um, I like it as it is. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's wonderful. How, um, how much of that was smoke and how much of it was Decibus Burton? Um, I, I haven't been able to find out. Right. Um, I think smoke would probably... Um, I mean, the decoration would have been subcontracted to some degree, so... It's really a case of um, uh, structural repair and so on. Mm -hmm. I would be very surprised if um, Smirk wasn't the lead figure there, right. because yes. Burton didn't do much else. Right. Yeah. The, 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 another area we were talking about uh, is il illustrated here, um, and it, it runs two topics together. One is um, how much the the brothers actually worked together mm. uh, in the inn um, because they had, I think, separate practices. Mm. Um, but um, if one looks particularly at paper buildings, the number four paper building <laughs> is indistinguishable uh, from mm. the, um, uh, the no, two and three. And if one looks at the plans upstairs, mm. one could see that uh, Robert actually did design mm. um, uh, a, a full run down to four, but the uh, benches uh, would, wouldn't have it, mm. Uh, mm. and they uh, kept some of the old building up there after the fire that burnt, uh, burnt paper buildings down in the 1830s. Yes. Um, but how much do you think they related to each other um, on these well, things? I think the first thing to remember about that is that they, there was a big age gap between the two. Um, I think, um, if I remember rightly, um, Sydney was 24 years younger right. than, than Robert. So he had 
a totally separate practice. Um, I mean, presumably, um, they got on reasonably well together, and they obviously both worked here. But um, I think we do have to see them as <coughs> two um, distinct architects. Um, uh, and one way of looking at that is that if you look at the last image I showed you of the images I showed you of the hall, I couldn't see Robert designing that. Right. It was too much of a classicist. Mm. But when, when we talk for paper buildings being Sydney's work, mm. um, is it really Sydney's work? Um, um, hard to say. Um, certainly the, the, the buildings at the end were. But, but the, the timing's right because yeah. he was surveyor. Yeah. But all he did was <laughs> execute what his brother had planned, didn't he? Well, it, um, you could say there's nothing wrong with that. No, no, no. But they're, they're, they're not his creation. No, they're not his creation. What was his creation was the building looking out over the garden. Oh, surely. Yes, yes. 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 Which yes. does establish a different architectural character. Yes. Uh, I, and, and do we know why? Oh, why? Yeah. Um, well, I suspect it's a change of taste among the benchers. Right. I think they wanted something that at least paid lip service to the kind of architecture that was increasingly going up um, in the middle of the 19th century, which um, was slightly more medievalist in character. Um, and also, I would guess, and it is no more than a guess, that um, these are buildings which look out onto a very beautiful landscape of lawn and trees. And people tended to think that medieval architecture um, matched the, the landscape rather better than classical. Could we look for a moment at just two other ranges of buildings, mm -hmm. uh, which um, were, were, were Smurf buildings, uh, Harcourt buildings. Mm -hmm. um, what do we know about um, uh, what, what they looked like or um, how far down to the um, river they went and whether they um, echoed what uh, Robert had designed in well, paper buildings. The answer to that is, first part is we don't know much what they looked like and I suspect like a deep end search um, among the archives here um, and it might well find some. I think they did stretch a bit further um, the, um, than, um, but, but not obviously as far um, as they do now. Um, right. The, yeah. Uh, and and their the, the look, so were they intended to complement each other, do we know? I think so. Yeah. Yes. yes. I, I don't think there was anything particular. I mean, these were, in a way, functional buildings, you have to remember. They're buildings for lawyers' chambers. There are indeed some um, chambers which were rented, as they had been in the 18th century, by people who had no real connection with the inns at all, but they brought in the income. Um, but um, the, the, there was no need, I think, to make them more elaborate um, than was necessary. The elaboration came um, with the church and above all the hall, and that's why I think so much effort went in. If you look in the archives here, there are a lot of stuff about the building of the hall and its decoration. This was, in a sense, I think, the inn asserting its own identity um, as a building which, uh, as an institution with a very long history. On, on a technical level, mm -hmm. you were talking to me also about, about concrete, about concrete. Which, which doesn't sound very exciting but enormously no. important because I think we stopped having fires afterwards. <laughs> That's right. It isn't very exciting, but um, it's certainly I, one of Smurf's main claims to fame as an architect was that he was one of the first architects to actually use concrete um, extensively. Um, not for the outsides of buildings. We're not talking about 1970s brutalism. Um, we're talking about floors um, mainly. Um, and it was efficient and particularly good for fire protection. Again, remember the um, the, the, the way that um, lawyers' chambers, with all their papers, could go up in flames, and indeed did, often. So that's why that's mentioned. 
And that must be another reason why the inn likes Merv and the old Merv as its outfit. And the younger one followed on naturally. I mean, it's a, you know, we're happy with Robert. Why don't we um, continue with Sydney? Yes, yes. Uh, and then finally, uh, your opinion. Um, who does the, uh, in 1870, not, not now, but in 1870 when one was walking around, mm -hmm. who would the Ian the Road be the greatest death to? Um, it would have to be Robert. Why? Um, because he's the one who really sets so much of the character of the Ian as it develops um, for the rest of the 19th century, up until the very end. Um, before I go to the house, um, I've got one uh, question at the moment online that's come through. Um, it was a very beautiful and interesting presentation and will remain memorable, especially for the lovely anecdote uh, about, about where you met your wife uh, <laughs> in that lovely building. I'm intrigued by the well, British actually, it was at a, uh, at a Triton traffic light. <laughs> 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 Don't it's spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm intrigued by the British Library dome. Uh, over the reading room. Uh, I love architecture and uh, for its architect or aesthetic power and beauty. Uh, please say more about the Oxbridge link that you've mentioned because I've lived in both cities and absolutely love the architectural aesthetic. Uh, thank you so much. Mm. Well, thank you for paying attention. If you want to read more about Oxbridge, I've written some books on architectural <laughs> Oxbridge and I've got another one coming out next year on the architecture of Oxford Libraries. Yes, I, did, I didn't mention, because I did say that there was so much to say about Jeffrey's yeah. achievements, uh, he has uh, a very particular interest in uh, Oxford and Oxford architecture as well, and is chairman of various uh, societies and the like, etc. So <laughs> he's a good man to have written the book. Um, now, um, can I open it to anybody who wishes to answer questions? Yes. Oh, well, hold on a moment. We need the microphone. Uh, not so that we, we, it's what we recorded. And yeah, are okay. Um, is this on? Is uh, it on? It is on, yes. Um, um, you didn't tell us anything about Sydney's training. Did he, uh, who, who, who did, uh, did he follow the same route as his brother or a different one? Yeah, he was trained under his brother. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah. Uh, oh, he trained by his brother. Yes, I see. Yeah. Yes, yeah. right. I mean, every indication is that they were they, they got on well together. Yeah. Yeah. There was no need for him to mm. do something else. Yeah. Yes, and d didn't travel to Greece and. Um, Not that I know. No. <laughs> no. In fact, I would know of it. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, um, I mean, he did build up quite a, a an interesting connection of his own. Um, he designed a number of um, buildings, but um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, please. Thank you. Dr. Tyack, you, you mentioned the fire in 1838 which destroyed part of paper buildings. Mm. Do we know how extensive the fire damage was um, and how much, how much the present paper buildings has of the old building somewhere in it? Um, that I am not able to really answer. Um, I think, um, let's say, I don't think um, the, the, the building was totally gutted. Um, I'm, uh, uh, but Jeffrey, can I be presumptuous and help here? Mm. Uh, because I, I've actually seen the archive on this mm. and, it, it, and the correspondence um, and some of the French papers on it. Um, and the, the answer is that um, the North End, it's a little confusing because the numbering of paper buildings when the fire took place is different from the numbering oh. of paper buildings as we know it now. But just using the modern numbering, um, one, uh, <coughs> forgive me, one, two, and three were um, all uh, seriously damaged, <coughs> particularly the top end uh, at um, one and two. And it wasn't the same shape in those days. You may remember from the um, pictures that uh, Dr. Tyack had up that there was a uh, a, a straight building without anything coming out and, and you didn't enter it um, from the facade facing the hall, you entered it from the side. Uh, and um, 
what happened was that um, one of our legal predecessors came home one evening after a, a, a fairly good night, uh, and the um, the candle in his uh, room uh, sadly uh, fell mm -hmm. over, uh, and uh, the, the fire took place. It, it then meant that they they had to knock down um, <coughs> one, two, and three. I think mostly one and two, uh, but three was pretty rickety. They were not going to um, knock down the far end and didn't. And it was maintained for a further four years, despite the fact that Robert uh, Smirk, uh, who was the surveyor, said that really should come down. Uh, the benchers said, no, pop it up. Uh, but Smirk, Smirk was right. Uh, and within uh, a decade, it had to come down. Uh, and um, uh, thus it then went into uh, the... Uh, the, the present line of buildings that you see. And if you go upstairs, you'll actually see um, in the exhibition, there are various alternatives where he's talking about what can be achieved. It's, it's quite interesting because he um, talks about changing the line uh, of the building. He wanted to change the line of paper buildings rather. Um, but again, uh, the bench weren't having it. Uh, and he, he had to uh, do the, the repair job uh, and it must have looked very odd uh, having half the propped up uh, stone uh, brick building um, uh, of an entirely different character for, for 10 years. But uh, that's what he was required to do, and no doubt he did it well. Mm. Well, thank you very much for that. Oh, sorry if I, no, uh, no, I, I had an opportunity to look at papers that you haven't seen. Um, yeah, and the usual answer to a question that you don't know the answer to is more research is needed. <laughs> in fact, um, when Master Crime has actually done the research on that building, so thank you for informing us about that. Over there. <clears throat> yes, thank you. I assume that you will agree that Sidney was also amenable with his patrons uh, following in his brother's footsteps mm -hmm. and of course also that they designed a lot of mem membership clubs in London yes, they did indeed. Um, and they yeah. particularly keen on the patronage of yes. Sir Robert Peel. Um, well I'm from Tubridge Wells and we have the body of Sydney in our local old cemetery and uh, this is his tomb mm. um, which is quite ornate. It was he asked John Loughborough Pearson to design it. And if anyone's got any comments on how he did it and why, I'd be most grateful. Yeah. There are pink granite pillars there, which I think was an innovation <coughs> of Sydney's work as well. So I was very interested on your comments well, in concrete. Thank you very much for that. And this is something, again, that I was unaware of. So if you could let me see that photograph afterwards, I'd be delighted to. Thanks. We, we, we'd love to have a copy of it for our archives, please. Yeah, mm. thank you. Where, where is the cemetery, by the way? It's Woodford Park Cemetery at Tubbs Wells, which okay. is the east of that building. Mm -hmm. So the cemetery is in Woodford Park, and then the other part of the mm -hmm. cemetery is in Tubbs Wells. Good. Thank you. Is Robert the actual chair of the cemetery? Yes, I think he is. W was there a debate? Um, after the, um, the, the the horrors of the Blitz um, of, of Neo G versus Gothic, I I ask because I I think it, this may be apocryphal, but I heard a story from a son of a bencher of a, probably the son of another bencher at the time, who after that that fateful night, he and benchers walked around, um, grinding the glass from Sydney Smirks Hall into the ground so there was no chance of it being rebuilt well <laughs> which that's a good story which i'm sure has quite a lot of truth to it because unfortunately um the, the, the war um were coincided with the lowest nadir of victorian architecture in in, in public taste and um i suspect they were only too glad to um to, to rebuild in the arguably somewhat bland neo-Georgian style that we see today. Yeah, thank you for that anecdote. That's, that's very, very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you. On, online, Jeffrey, there are, uh, there are only peons of praise. 
Um, there are no real questions. Uh, thank you for an illuminating presentation. Thank you for being so informative and interesting. Uh, thank you for this lecture, etc., etc. Ah, is this a question? <laughs> ah, uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation and the slides. Can the public visit the Inner Temple when it's open? Yes, certainly. Oh, very Please much come. So. Well, you'll be most welcome. Yes, yes. Now, what do you see? Thank you. Can I just ask what it means to be, have been the inn surveyor in this period? I mean, we are used to the surveyor being a full-time employee, but I have the impression the Smirks were carrying on their architectural private practices and... Uh, um, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I mean, surveyors until the 1830s um, had not been a recognised profession, but in the 1830s, the Institute of Surveyors was established. Um, and that's because there were so many of them who wanted accreditation so that they could use that um, to, uh, to help their careers. Um, before then, the words architect and surveyor were almost interchangeable um, for a lot of the time. I mean, obviously, nobody would have called Christopher Wren a surveyor, but a lot of the ordinary everyday architects um, would call themselves surveyors. That began to change um, in, in a big way um, once you started getting people going on the grand tour and that kind of thing um, in the um, 1860s. And the fact that the Royal Academy established scholarships for students to travel abroad to look at good classical architecture plays a part in that. But the sheer volume of business um, meant that you needed surveyors who weren't necessarily architects, but they did need proper um, training and professional accreditation. And that's what the Institute of Surveyors set out to do. Well, I think finally, before we close, is, is there not one other plan here which shows the work of the Smirks? Uh, at the end, is is that uh, um, have, yes? Have you been changing the um, the slides? I think if you see, there's one. I more. can run back to them if you like. No, there's one more. No, no, it will be at the end, I think, or maybe it'll be. No, there isn't the one. Yes, there it is. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, we do have a look at that, um, and it does um, <coughs> show you very well what is smirk and what is not smirk. Um, with the mauve being um, Robert Smirk and the green um, being Sidney. So very helpful map. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's, it's a huge amount of the, of the inn by 1870s. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much. Uh, tremendously illuminating uh, and very clearly uh, set out to us for, for those of us who, who didn't know about the Smirks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.